Last time, the Koreans had almost destroyed the Japanese in a surprise attack, but failed to do so due to poor time management. Pyongyang was taken, and the Ming are finally in Korea. Kobayakawa tried to take the Chola province, but was pushed back and forced to retreat back to Seoul. This week, we head south because once again, Yi Sun Shin is on the move. My name's Stefan, and this is Japan at War. Three fourths of Korea has so far been taken. The Japanese have practically conquered Korea. They're also more vulnerable now than ever. Let me explain. Despite the relatively low deaths in the Japanese armies, the contingents close to the border with China were the smallest that they had ever been. Every time they took a town, they had to leave men behind to protect these new territories. On top of that, weapons and armor needed to be repaired and sometimes replaced entirely. Gunpowder, which pretty much what was, well, what had gotten them this much success, was also starting to run out. The only way really to get the badly needed supplies so far was about 700 kilometer walk from Busan to Pyongyang. Was it possible? Yes. Was it practical? No. What was badly needed now was the supply routes that the Japanese Navy was supposed to have opened up by this time. But they didn't exist. What was left of the Korean Navy had done an incredible job of halting that advance. Hideyoshi, after getting reports of this, sent a message on July 31st that his naval commanders, Wakizaka Yasuharu, Kuki Yoshitaka, and Kato Yoshiaki, should combine their forces and eliminate this threat. There was a big problem, though. For one, the naval commanders hadn't actually stayed with their ships. They had gone forward to help out with the invasion. The other problem was that they had already heard about the Korean naval attacks and had rushed forward on their own without hearing this command. Wakizaka Yasuharo had gotten to his ships first and had already set sail. Kunishi Kinaga back in Pyongyang was, well, still incredibly confident that he would get his reinforcements and supplies. It was true that they had underestimated the Korean Navy, but in his mind, and from what he knew, this was about to be corrected. Meanwhile, Yi Sun Sin had been at Yusu repairing and rearming his ships. He then, from a scout, got word that Japanese ships were beginning to move westwards once again. On August 10th, Yeo Ki, after receiving the same news, showed up at Yusu to combine their fleets once again. They then spent the entirety of the next day drilling a new battle formation that Yi Sun Sin wanted to use the Crane Wing. Following the next day, the United Fleet sailed east to Noryang to rendezvous with Wan Kyun who had recently been able to repair seven ships, which brought the combined fleet's total numbers at this, well, it was about 55. They set sail on August 14th, early in the morning, with the knowledge that the Japanese were at Kyanaryang. They had covered half the distance when they saw two Japanese scout ships immediately turn around and fled to Kyanaryang straight. Yi Sun Sin at first followed closely behind until he noticed a huge line of warships waiting for him. He held his fleet back. There was around 70, 73 ships in total, 36 large, 24 median, and 13 smaller ships. This was Wakizaka's fleet. Wang Kyun, though, 
wasn't phased by this at all. I mean, they'd won so many battles and hadn't lost once. Yi Sun Sin was a lot more cautious though and moved his fleet to open waters off Hansan Island. The strait was narrow and didn't leave much room to maneuver in, and on top of that, the reefs and rocks threatened to sink his ships. Then the enemy itself would have to be dealt with. He used a strategy that he had employed at the Battle of Sachion. He would send in a small group of ships into a strait and have them retreat. The Japanese, just as they had done before, chased after the Korean ships. When they were in open waters, the Koreans first approached in a line, and as the Japanese approached the Korean line, they morphed into a crescent shape. Surrounding the Japanese ships, the Japanese did do their best to fight back, but just as before, the hull of the Korean ships was just too thick for the matchlocks to do any real damage. The turtle ships bounced off the Japanese ships, blasting holes in their sides whenever they could. Every now and then, the Korean ships, after raining down arrows, would be able to capture and board a ship cutting off heads to bring back to their ships. They even set fire to capture Japanese ships and then sent them loose to crash into the other Japanese vessels. This battle lasted the entire day and had actually drift all the way from the waters off Hansan Island back to the Kyonaryang Strait. The Korean men were by this time extremely exhausted. Darkness was starting to fall, and Yi Soon Sin still was wary of sending too many of his ships into the strait. It was thus decided that what remained of the now retreating enemy wasn't worth the chase and let them go. It was recorded that 59 of the enemy's ships had either been captured. Or destroyed. The remaining ships seemed to have never really entered into the battle and had cautious, cautiously lagged behind. The oarmen didn't stop rowing until they reached Kim Hai, several kilometers up the Naktong River near Busan. One of the remaining vessels was the Hayabune, carrying naval commander Yasuharu. One of Wakizaka's clan chroniclers wrote this about the man. Arrows struck against his armor, yet he was fearless. Even though for every one man still living, there was ten dead bodies on the deck. The enemy attacked fiercely, trying to kill him and sink his ship. The enemy continuously shot fire arrows at his ship. Yet Yasuharo's fast ship was able to make it away and withdrew to Kim Hai. The Korean accounts of the battle say that Wakizaka had simply panicked and fled. And I will leave it up to you which source you would like to believe. There's also some discrepancy about how many Japanese actually did die in this battle. For example, the Japanese sources say that 200 were able to swim to a nearby small island to safety. Korean sources actually say 400 did. Either way, it's said that when one of the surviving captains realized the island was barren, he took the responsibility for their situation. The man sat down and committed harakiri. The rest of the men were simply left to starve. And this is where we will leave you. Before you go, I would like to ask you, the audience, a question. What would you do with the survivors? As we've covered before in this series, every time Yi Sun Sin attacks, there always seem to be men that are able to swim to safety. And I'd like to see what you guys would do. 
I look forward to discussing this with you guys in the comments section down below. Tune in next week as Yi Soon Sin confronts the remaining two naval commanders, Kato Yoshiaki and Kyuki Yoshitaka. Will he repeat the same tactics? And will the Japanese fall for it once again? Find out in the next episode of Japan at War. See you then.